And so finally they have resorted to putting him on this Isle of Patmos where he would be exiled with some of the most wanted and most horrific criminals of his day on an island alone there to work the mines and to work uh, the quarries and to do manual labor. He's almost 90 years old. It is a difficult moment, but it is in the midst of this that God gives him a vision. And if you weren't here last week, what we really focused on last week is the fact that our circumstances are never by accident and that even in our difficult moments, God has orchestrated it for a reason. And John may have never seen this vision and we may have never known this reality had John not gone through the difficulty that he faced. And that encourages me today to know there's purpose in every bit of my pain. But today I want to look at what this vision was because obviously John saw Jesus. That's what he has been writing to us up to this point. But notice the progression of what he has described to us so far. He began in the first few verses giving us an introduction to who Jesus is overall and what Jesus has done for us. He told us that he is the firstborn of many brethren, that he is the the, the faithful and true witness. He said that he has by his blood bought us and redeemed us and made us kings and priests unto our God. And then he goes on to say that this Jesus is the Jesus who is the king who will come again to the earth to reign and to rule over the kingdoms of the world. And then he stopped for a minute and said, I'm not just talking about what Jesus did and who he was. I'm not just talking about who he's going to be. He then steps into eternity and tells us he is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the beginning and the end. He shows us this powerful picture of the totality of Jesus in the history of humanity. That he is bigger than all of us because he was before us and he will be after us. But then he finds himself seeing this vision. And where he's seeing Jesus here is not Jesus who was. It's not Jesus who will be. But it is Jesus right now. The vision John saw is the accurate depiction of where he is and what he looks like. Not tomorrow, not next year, not 30 years ago, but right now today. This is Jesus. And when he looks at him, he says, first of all, I find him in the middle of the golden candlesticks. He said, I turned and I saw seven lampstands. Seven candlesticks, different versions say it different ways. What it really was talking about was more like a lamp. It was a a, a, a seven-tiered lamp that was lighting the room. And this is symbolic, and he will later tell us in verse 20 that these lampstands are a picture of the seven churches in Asia. He said, I saw him standing in the middle of the lampstands. What we learn from this is that Jesus is in the middle of his church. Come on, somebody. Y'all quiet this morning. There's, there, there is a movement in the world today that has been driven by deconstructionism which has created this statement, this concept and it didn't create the concept but it's created the phraseology and the victimhood that connects with it called church hurt. Now let me be very clear with this. If you have never been hurt in church I wonder why you didn't come the second time. But you understand how many times I've been offended, upset, disappointed, and frustrated at a restaurant. But I've not given up eating. And and I'm, I'm not ashamed to tell you the truth. I've gotten angry, I've had horrible service, a bad experience, and and gone home from a restaurant. And gone back to the same restaurant again. Not only did I keep going to restaurants. I went back to the same one. But God forbid. You ever have a bad moment in church. Because once you do. 
well, then God isn't real. Uh, this is a tactic of the enemy. Now, don't, get you, don't you get me wrong. There is some horrible things that happen under the auspice of Christianity and Christian people. In fact, until you've been a pastor, you don't know the half. Because you think Christian people are mean to Christian people. You ought to see how they treat pastors now. You, you ought to hear some of the things that are said to me and done to me that you don't know anything about because I ain't going to get up here and talk about it. I'm not going to tell everybody about it, but I just deal with it. I, you, 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 we, we deal with this kind of stuff. It's real, but it's a tactic of the enemy to try to get our minds off. And so we've got the, oh, I'm so hurt at the church. And so you get people making this statement. I love Jesus, but I hate the church. You can't. Because Jesus is in the church. That's where he is. And this is what he calls the church. He calls the church his bride that he's coming for. Now I'm going to tell you something real quick. You want to know how to be on my good side? It's to like me and to love my family. You want to know how to get on my bad side? It's to mistreat anybody in my family. And especially my wife. You come up to me and say, oh, Pastor, and we love you, but we just don't like. I'll say, you better. I'm saved, sanctified, and full of the Holy Ghost, but I still punch you right in the nose. You start talking bad about my wife because she's my wife. And I'm going to stand up here flat foot and tell you something I know for a fact. She ain't perfect. Nobody is. But I don't need her to be perfect. She's my wife. I love her just the way she is. And sure, there are things she does that I wish she did differently, things that I do that she wishes I did, all that kind of stuff. But the truth of the matter is, don't you dare talk about my wife. And then people want to walk around thinking they can talk about the church and be cool with Jesus. John wanted us to understand that Jesus is not separate from his church. And I wonder if the reason why John saw this portion of the vision was for this era right now so that we could understand that in a society that is trying to separate the two and make Jesus his own entity and the church this horrible thing when in fact the church is what Jesus is building. The church is what Jesus is returning for. The church is what Jesus is using to reach the world with the gospel. The church is a powerful thing and Jesus Jesus is in the middle of it, and if Jesus is in the middle of it, then I'm going to get in the middle of it too. Y'all quiet today on that one. I feel like, I feel like some people say, I, I love because, you know, uh, I was raised in independent Pentecostal holiness, and we, we thought all organizations were of the devil. And I remember a, a, a guy that went to the college where I went to was a part of the Assemblies of God and some of the independent holiness preachers were telling him how horrible the Assemblies of God were. And, and this is what he said, and I loved it, and I, and I use this regularly. He said, I think the Assemblies of God are like Noah's Ark. It sure does stink sometimes, but at least it's still floating. And I think we can make that bigger than the Assemblies of God. I think we can make that the global big C church. It stinks a lot of the time. You got that many animals, there's going to be some manure. You got this many people, there's going to... If everybody would just be perfect, it'd be all right. But this many people, this many personalities, this many attitudes, this many opinions, there's going to be some... Trying not to say the words my mama would get mad at me for saying. There's going to be some manure. There's going to be some stink. But it's still floating. 
It's lasted through every generation. Every tyrant and emperor that has risen to bring it down has gone by the wayside and the church is still moving forward. Every empire that has risen, every other entity on the earth that has risen has fallen and been broken down while the church continues to move forward. So I don't know about you, but if Jesus thinks the church is good enough to be smack dab in the middle of, I think I'll get in the middle of it too. But it also lets us see the purpose of the church, that the church is called to be light in the darkness. You know, the interesting thing about light is light has never been called or requested to curse or rebuke darkness. It dispels it by its existence. I think where we have gotten so messed up in the church is we have gotten so vocal in our bushel. What are you saying? When someone has a light, they don't hide it under a bushel. We get real loud in our sanctuary. And we talk about everything that's wrong with the world in our sanctuary. But then when we go out in the world, I asked you last week, John is on Patmos because he was convicted of being a Christ follower who wouldn't keep his mouth shut about Jesus for the gospel. That's why he was convicted. I asked you last week, how many of you could be convicted by a court of your peers on the evidence that you share your faith in Jesus? Not can you be convicted of you came to church on Sunday morning. Obviously, you're here. But what about the rest of the week? What if I was to call some of your co-workers up for a, a cross-examination this morning and I asked them, so, uh, so-and-so really outspoken with their faith, would some of them look at me and go, they go to church? But boy, we, we curse the darkness. We talk about, boy, things are bad. It's getting bad out there. You know why it's getting bad out there? Because we're keeping our light in here. Because darkness is actually an illusion. It does not exist. It is simply the absence of light. And light in its presence dispels all darkness. Just when the light comes in, the darkness flees because darkness has no power, has no authority, has no ability. Its only authority is in the absence of light. And so when we stay out of things, we allow darkness to prevail. But when we step into things, we don't have to curse them, we don't have to rebuke them, we don't have to preach at them. We just got to show them the light. We do this by these lamps were powered by the oil. We do this by the power of the Holy Spirit. It's not by might, it's not by power, but it's by His Spirit that we are able to be who we've been called to be. Jesus is among the candlesticks. He's amongst, amidst the church today. But then let's look at the description of Jesus. In verses 12 through 16, He begins to describe Jesus. Now let me stop right here and give you some revelation understanding. When you look at the book of Revelation, there are some things that are literal. There are some things that are figurative. Let me ask you a question very quickly. Are you in church this morning? Does this look like a lampstand to you? Jesus, John said, I saw Jesus amongst the lampstands. And then later tells us in verse 20, the lampstands are the church. Which means he was making a figurative description of what he saw. This was a metaphorical vision. This was not literal. He did not see Jesus literally. Jesus is not literally in the midst of lampstands. Jesus is in the midst of the picture of what is the church. So then understanding that when we begin to look at this description of Jesus, he's not describing to us the actual physical attributes of Jesus. He's describing to us in this vision these metaphorical features that give him a picture of who Jesus is and what Jesus is capable of in this moment. You understand that? 
So let's begin to look at this description. He said, first of all, I saw him clothed in a white robe. This is like the robe of Aaron. It is a picture of Jesus being our high priest who is atoning for our sin even today. That because of his sacrifice, we know our sins can be forgiven this morning. He has not given up that office. He has not stopped being the one who atones for our sins this morning. That's why the church ought to celebrate today that we still have an active high priest who is making intercession session for us who's going to God saying don't count it to them because I paid the price for it he then goes on to say that he has white hair now I want you to understand that this white hair is not a picture of age although he is the ancient of days but this white hair is a picture of wisdom it is an understanding that he knows what he is doing. You need to understand this morning that we are living in a world where things seem so incredibly chaotic and confusing. And I have experienced multiple occasions in my personal life in the last six months where I have literally looked up to heaven and said, God, what are you doing? But let me assure you this morning, John saw Jesus and he saw that he was in a position of wisdom. And he tells us today, don't you worry, don't you get nervous, don't you let circumstances move you. Jesus knows what he is doing. I don't see it. I don't understand it. But I trust that he is a wise and capable Savior who is leading and directing every area and avenue of my life to an expected end that he has prepared for me. And so if it's going on, it may not be good, but he will work it together for my good. I then see, he said, eyes like a flame of fire. He's letting us know that Jesus sees everything. He sees and this flame of fire burns beyond the evident to the deeper things. You need to understand this morning that when Jesus looks at you, He does not only see your actions, but He sees your motivation. This is both a celebratory and scary thought. Because what it means is there are some people in this room who are still making some really bad decisions. Like you do some really dumb stuff. But Jesus sees your motivation. And he says, well, I wish they'd get that together, but their heart is right. And then there are other people in this room that seem to be doing everything just right. But Jesus sees through that they're not doing it because they love him. They're not doing it because they want to follow him. They're doing it because they're afraid of what other people would think about them. Or they're doing it so other people will be impressed with them. Or they're doing it so they can feel better than other people. You can fool me and you can fool your spouse and you can fool people all over this congregation. But you cannot fool Jesus. He has eyes like a flame of fire. And he sees right through your facade. He sees right through your fake. He sees right through your hypocrisy. He sees right through it. So you best live holy for holy sake. You best fall in love with Jesus and do what you do because you want to serve Him, not because of what anyone else thinks or what anybody else says or what anybody else can reward you with. He's looking, He's looking. His eyes like a flame of fire also see everything that's happening around us. I need somebody to hear this morning, Jesus sees you. You have questioned whether God is aware of your circumstances. And I want you to understand something. There is nowhere and there is no thing that can happen in your life that is hidden from his vision. He sees and he knows and he is well aware of where you are. And as I just told you, he knows what he's doing. So be assured you're not falling through the cracks. You're not the one that he forgot about. He didn't get up this morning and go, oh snap, I haven't checked on them in a month. 
He sees what's going on in your life. He knows what he's doing and he's working it together for your good. Stop letting the devil lie to you and tell you that God has forgotten you, that God is overlooking you because Jesus sees you. He then says, I saw that he had feet like brass. This is to a picture that tells us that he has the ability to endure. The brass feet says he's not going anywhere. He's not falling apart. He's not easily defeated. He endures. And we know that to be true because Jesus has stood the test of time. You know how many things have come and gone since Jesus was on the earth? And yet still today... Millions upon millions of people are gathering all over the world to celebrate a man who died 2,000 years ago. That's pretty enduring. There have been some other leaders who've made amazing splashes in the pan. I mean, for a while, they had a large following. For a while, everybody knew their name. For a while, everybody was looking to them. But they all died and are gone and have been, for the most part, forgotten as just footnotes in history. Only Jesus remains because he is an enduring Savior. He's not coming yesterday and going tomorrow. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He will endure. He will outlast. And I don't know what you're facing this morning. I don't know what situation you're dealing with. But here's one thing I do know. When that situation is gone, Jesus will still remain. There's a lot of people getting a lot of all worked up about a lot of stuff. We got people all over our campus is worked up about the Middle East. Let me tell you something. Long after this Middle Eastern crisis has passed, Jesus will remain. And I'll also tell you something else just to parenthetically insert. Israel will remain. You say, well, well is, is Israel perfect? Nope. But God never called them to be perfect. He just called them my people. Did you read the Old Testament? (laughs) They've never been perfect. But they've always been protected. Because that's what God decided to do. And if you've got a problem with that, you can talk to him about it. But I'm just going to tell you something. You, You can rest assured what Jesus is doing on the earth. It's going to remain. It's going to endure. Why does that matter to me? Well, because if he endures... He can empower me to endure. Jesus said that it would be to those who endure to the end, them are the ones who will be overcomers. You know how we're going to endure to the end? I'll tell you how it's not going to be. It's not going to be because we got it. Because I don't know about you, but I, I live daily the old Charlie Brown cartoon. Have you ever heard about the one where Charlie Brown asked the question, Where does one go to give up? Because if you could tell me where it is, I'll be there in the morning. Every day I wake up and there is a part of me that's going, man, how are we going to do this another day? I I, I don't know how I'm going to get through this, get through that. Especially the last month or so, I've had a lot of stuff with our family, physical stuff with the baby and with Shantae. But then I got stuff with business. I got stuff with, I got all kinds of stuff going on. It's all burning at the same time. And there are mornings I got up and I'm like, dear God, how am I going to get through today? The answer is Jesus. Because you know what I found that he'll do? This is what he told Paul. He said, um, I'm going to give you a grace that is sufficient. Which means it's enough. But he also said, I'm going to do it every day. He said, don't you worry about tomorrow because I got you today. Tomorrow will take care of itself when it gets here. You're just going to have grace for today. I wish I had grace for the next 10 years. That would be fantastic. Come on, somebody. Grace just hit me. That would carry me through whatever 10 years had to come. But that's not how it works. Because you know what would be a problem if that happened? Is I'd squander all that grace in the next six months. Because that's what we do. But he gives me enough grace for today. And then tomorrow, whatever tomorrow brings, I know I'll have grace for that. A month ago... 
on a Friday afternoon, I didn't know that I needed the grace to go through a life-threatening surgery with my wife in 12 hours. I didn't know that was going to happen. I didn't know to pray for that. I didn't know to prepare for that. That was off of my radar. But you know what? When it happened, there was a grace for that. It showed up because he gave me the power to endure. I, I, you don't understand. Mentally, six months to a year ago, I would have curled up in a fetal position and cried in the corner if I'd had to go through what I've been through the last month. But you know why I've made it through? Not because I'm stronger. Not because I got it all together. No, I made it through because he's given me grace to endure. John let us know his feet are like brass. means he's going to stand the test of time and he's going to help you stand the test of time. Then he said his voice is like the sound of many waters. His voice speaks to us about his power and authority and his ability to create because God always creates with his voice. God doesn't do anything in Scripture. He says and things happen. Come on now, you read the text. In fact, most of Jesus, there's a couple times Jesus spit on the sand, do a little extracurricular. But more times than not, what did Jesus do while he was on the earth? He spoke and the storm stopped. He spoke and they were healed. He spoke and the demons flee. He spoke, he had that authority. That was him in his human flesh denying his deity. John said, you ought to hear his voice now. While he was on earth, he had a voice that could stop a storm. Now that he is in his heavenly position, he has a voice that can stop every storm. He has a voice that can create whatever is needed. And that's why when we are living in such difficult times and you know you, you look around and go, what am I going to do financially? What am I going to do about, what about the economy? What about all this stuff? Calm down. One word from God. Jesus speak one word and everything you'll ever need the rest of your life can appear in an instant because he said so. So what are you worried about? I'll tell you what I'd be worried about, whether I could hear his voice or not. That's all I'd be worried about is if that voice has power, if that voice has authority, if that voice has wisdom and direction, then I need to hear that voice. And the reason why we can't hear that voice is not because that voice is not strong and powerful. It's because it's drowned out by all the foolishness, foolishness that we continue to... I tell you, I, I'm sorry I'm preaching longer than I meant to this morning, but I, I'll tell you, the last few weeks, I've been in the hospital rooms a lot, and... And if you know me, I'm a major Kentucky basketball fan. And so we've kind of had a bit of an interesting month. Lost our coach. Praise God in heaven. We're glad he's gone now. Loved him to death till he went to Arkansas. And now I just soon he just, you know, may the ants of a thousand anthills infest his drawers tonight. And I don't mean on his dresser. Come on, somebody. But I found, I found myself on social media a lot more. And I'll be honest with you, the, there is a darkness that comes with that. I mean, I was looking for who's the next coach, who are the players we're going to get, that kind of thing. But in the midst of looking for all that stuff, there's all kinds of other stuff. Just bad news, bad news, people fighting about this, that, and the other, and all this stuff. And I've seen all these videos of all these protests and all this. There's just darkness. And on Friday afternoon, I had to take my mom to meet my dad halfway. And I dropped her off, and then I was coming home by myself. And, and I just turned on worship music. And I'm going to tell you, two hours of shutting out the noise and just creating the presence of God literally shifted my spirit in such a way that I said, my goodness, what are we doing to ourselves? 
Because I understand that what I've done with social media over the last month is not typical for me. But I also recognize that it is typical for a lot of y'all. And I'm like, of course I would be depressed. Of course I would be despondent. If this was what I fed myself all day long, feeding, feeding, feeding. But how powerful it is to take just a few moments and clear your mind of all of that and focus your mind on who God is and what He's saying and what He's doing. And you know what? As soon as I cleared my mind, His voice began to speak and He began to speak clearly. He said, I got this. I got you. Just calm down down son just sit down and watch this I got this his voice is powerful it's reassuring he said it, it, it out of his mouth came a sword and of course that sword is the word of God it is a weapon both of offense and defense with it Christ conquers his enemies and defends his church it is a sword with two edges it cuts both ways with one one side it stays our sin and with the other side it cuts our self righteousness it is the sword of the spirit the word of God that pricks the heart and brings sinners down to repentance before the sovereignty of Jesus Christ I'm thankful that he speaks the word of God Then he said, and I'm almost done, the countenance. He said it speaks of purity, dignity, majesty, the glory of Christ, who is the Son of Righteousness. That is the word S-U-N, of Righteousness. In the spiritual realm, Christ is the S-U-N, the Son. He is the source. He is the stainer, sustainer. He is the strength of everything that is spiritual in our lives. If you look directly at the noonday sun, it will burn into your eyes so that when you look away, no matter where you look, you still see the sun. You ever done that? Looked up and hope you didn't do it during the eclipse. Because you'll still see the sun today if you did that. You look up, you see the sun for a minute, you look away and then everywhere you look there is the sun. It's called having sun burnt eyes. And even so, that is true when you look upon Jesus by faith and you see the glory of God in Him, no matter where you look, you'll start to see Him. It's no wonder the old timers used to say, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in His wonderful face. And the things of this world will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. Can I tell you every bit of your fear, every bit of your anxiety, every bit of your worry, every bit of your frustration, every bit of you fill in the blank in your life could be corrected by one good look at Jesus. (laughs) Because if you'd ever see Him as He is, where He is, what He is, it would take away all of these things that you are so concerned about because you'd recognize that He is in a position of power and authority and what's better is He is working all things together for you. So three things very quickly that we learn. First of all, we learn from this vision that we are not alone. He is with us. I know sometimes we feel alone. There have been moments that I have felt all alone. But it was a feeling, not a reality. We are not alone. Jesus is with us. The second thing is that Jesus is still in control. I know it doesn't look like that. But he's orchestrating. He is not the originator of the things that are happening. But he is the orchestrator. He is the divine string puller. And all of the enemy's plans and plots are just like a, 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 a puppet being used by a, by a puppet master as Jesus is working all things together to bring to pass that glorious moment we talked about just a couple weeks ago when he will return and he will rule and he will reign and peace will return to the earth and sorrow and sickness and death will be defeated. All of those things are true. They are coming and all that is happening 
happening around us is him allowing the enemy to set the stage with his own foolish plots and plans because he is in control. And so that means finally, no matter what it looks like right now, we win. I need you to know that this morning. That it doesn't feel like it right now. Sometimes I feel like we're losing on all fronts. I feel like culture is beyond our grasp. I feel like being able to move forward is beyond our grasp. I feel like so many things that I, 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 I would love to see happen on the earth and in the church and in our community. I just like, man, it just feels like it, every time we take one step forward, we take three steps backwards. And it, it, it don't feel like we're winning right now. But I need you to understand something. We are. We are. We're winning. It's just a matter of time. It's like the old poem, and I'm done today. A lady wrote the poem because one day she stood on the shoreline of the ocean and she watched the waves as they would come in so powerfully and crash into the rocks on the side of the shoreline. And they seemed so powerful and they seemed so intent, but they would crash and then retreat in apparent defeat. And she thought to herself, man, all that effort, all that power, all that energy, and nothing. But she said, I heard the Lord speak to me and said, you are thinking about now, but give it some time. Because that wave today doesn't seem like it's done much. But those waves over the course of days, weeks, Months, years, decades are going to gr gradually but definitely push those rocks away and erode them little bit by little bit. But if you give it time, the tide will win. And I'm telling you this morning, it doesn't matter what it looks like in your life, in your situation, in the world around us. The only thing between victory and Jesus is a little bit of time. He wins. And if we're with him, we win too. I was never, and I know I'm, I'm going to surprise several of you with this, but prepare yourselves. I was never a stellar athlete. Average at best. But I hated to lose. And so you know what I learned the gift of real early? Was the gift of being able to tell who could do better than me. And always positioning myself on their team. Because I understood if they win, I win. If I'm on the right team. Some of you don't feel like winners today. You don't feel like you have what it takes to be victorious. And that's all right. Because in this, you don't have to do anything. We've got, forgive me if this is great, we have the greatest of all time. Jesus, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the overcoming Savior. He don't need anybody else to win. He just wants you to enjoy his victory with him. Stand with me all over this house today. Thanks for watching this word today. I hope that it challenged you and I hope it gave you some practical application for how you can follow Jesus more effectively. If by chance you're watching and you have never made Jesus Lord of your life, let's do that right now. If you just pray these simple words with me, the words aren't magic, but what you're saying, if you believe in your heart, it's going to change your entire life. Dear Jesus, I am a sinner. I believe you are a savior. I ask you to forgive me. I ask you to cleanse me. And I declare that you are the Lord of my life. And from this day forward, I will follow you to the best of my ability. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer today, we are so excited because you just began the first step of an amazing journey of following Jesus. But one thing's for sure, you can't do this alone. 
You need community. You need a church family. So please reach out to us. Let us know you prayed the prayer and we'll give you some next steps about how you can follow Jesus and continue in your faith. Thanks for watching today. We love you and I hope you'll come back and watch again next week when we have another word that I believe will minister to your life.